So uh, this is the second segment of the seminar. Um, uh, my name is Larry Taylor. I'm president of People for Democratic Party Reform, and I'm here today with my co-chair, uh, with my co-parliamentarian, Carrie Capen. Hi, guys. So what we're talking about in this segment is the rights of delegates and specifically about what has been done to the rights of delegates in the 2020 convention. This is a little wonky um, and we're going to get into some very specific language, but it's really how how our rights have been taken away in this convention. And it's important for everyone to understand what happened. This is not some uh, incomprehensible process done by some undefined group of people. We know exactly who did this uh, and <laughs> where changes need to be made going forward. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the relationship of the governing documents inside of an organization. Uh, and we're using the Democratic Party as an example, but you, you, it, you will find the same structure in any group that has a set of bylaws and a charter and standing rules and all that stuff. So in the Democratic Party, which, is, uh, which dates from the early 1800s, uh, we have the Democratic Party Charter, which is a, um, and certainly in its first section, a very aspirational document where they talk about the, how much they love uh, all, all the Democrats and how valuable we are down at the grassroots level. And it's very, it's very mom and apple pie, great document. Governing that uh, is the party bylaws. So anything in the bylaws has to be consistent with what's in the charter. And then below that is the regulations of the rules and bylaws committee, which has to be consistent with everything in the party bylaws. So all the power that was given to the rules and bylaws committee stems from the charter and the bylaws itself. The, the, the rules and bylaws committee has very specific powers that have been given to them. And one of the things that they do is that they issue the call to the convention and they issue the guidelines for the delegate selection plan which many of you are probably familiar with. They've been around for over a year and we uh, follow them for the selection of the delegates. Um, there were a couple of other things going on also. So there's the parliamentary authority, which for the Democratic Party is Robert's Rules of Order. And the parliamentary authority is used when something is not defined in the charter or the bylaws. So the, the, the default processes, if something's not, not superseded by what is in the bylaw, what is in the bylaws of the charter, then you can find that in the parliamentary authority. So if, if there's something in the bylaws that overrules the parliamentary authority, then the bylaws um, uh, super, uh, supersede. If you remember that there was a unity report that came out of the 2016 convention, it was, it was approved in the the concept of it was approved in the rules committee. It was then brought to the floor and approved as a motion from the rules committee. And it was approved on the convention floor. And uh, what that report did was it was about making some fundamental changes to the 2020 convention. And so, the, you know, we saw some of those things uh, manifest itself. Uh, so the, the rule about uh, uh, superdelegates not voting on the first round uh, was a result of the unit commission. And I believe they did some cleanup on the caucus states and how counts were reported. Um, but those changes only are in effect uh, for the 2020 call convention and there's nothing binding going forward. And so there was a bunch of discussion about what happens going forward. And I've just heard rumors about what happens, but no facts, but you know, that that is addressing the problem really low in the hierarchy of documents. And so what People for Democratic Party Reform is proposing is that we make changes to the party bylaws and the charter itself so that these fundamental changes to make the Democratic Party more democratic are built into the governing documents and it's not something that someone can, can just ignore uh, later on. So, uh, you know, so Larry kind of covered what, uh, you know, documents to fool this whole process um, so here's kind of an overview of the structure of the party. So it says right in the charter that the ultimate authority is the Democratic National Convention. So the Convention of Delegates, that happens every four years, they are the ones that are supposed to be running the whole show. Uh, obviously, we know that that's only marginally true these days. Um, so then you have the National Committee. So that's, you know, the the much maligned DNC, 
Um, the DNC is made up of delegates and elected officials and all sorts of people. Um, and then they form the Rules and Bylaws Committee, um, and they also help um, organize state, uh, you know, the parties in the state. They support them and whatnot. And then the State Central Committee feed back into that. And so it's a, a, there's a little bit of give and take there. Um, further complicated, the relationship between the National Committee and the State Committees um, there's a lot of top-down leadership and whatnot, but really their authority over the states is kind of murky, um, to say the least. It's all very complicated. And <laughs> um, so, you know, there's there's all of that. But but just keep in mind that that top of that pyramid is the national convention. So the delegates that are sent to the national convention are supposed to be the most um, uh, powerful group. They're the ones, um, I don't have it in front of me, but the, the threshold to like change the car charter is lower at the national convention than it is at a regular DNC meeting um, because that's how they have it set up. But so, you know, needless to say, the powers that be try and restrict the rights of the delegates down as low as possible so that they, they don't go crazy and enact democracy in the Democratic Party. <laughs> So you want to keep the structure in mind when we talk about who's changing who and telling who what they can and cannot do. Yeah, National Convention, <laughs> the DNC, the Rules and Bylaws Committee, uh, and then off to one side, the State Central Committees, because that's kind of a, a separate category. <laughs> so as we said in the, 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 the previous uh, segment, your rights in a normal convention, uh, you have the your basic rights in a democratic organization, which is the right to attend meetings, you have the right to make motions, you have the right to speak and debate, and you have the right to vote. And these apply to conventions. Right. So your rights in electronic meetings, because you know now with COVID and everything, we got to have electronic meetings. You still have, you know, you should still have all of those rights. Um, so, um, so you should have the right. To set up electronic provisions, so you should vote on who uh, you know the, the what technology is used for speaking, what technology is used for voting, um, and if they're not doing that, um, then that's uh, not very democratic of them because you know if you haven't if the if the assembly hasn't agreed to the method by which that's why you adopt rules at the beginning of a convention. Or you adopt rules when you form a society so that everybody is clear on the methods for enacting business. And that's not, it shouldn't be any different for an electronic meeting is what rules are we as a body going to agree to in order to do things in our meetings? And since one of your rights to do things is to make motions and speak and debate and to vote, then you need to have technology to support that. And the, the parliamentary authority, and this is where parts of the parliamentary authority are universal concepts. A, the definition of a democratic meeting is for people to meet in one room. So you can see other people and you can talk to other people and you can actually have a meeting. And anything that deviates from that uh, means that you have given up rights for something. So you, you can do an approximation of that in an electronic meeting by giving everyone the ability to speak uh, but you know, what if you um, what if you have a disability that makes that un you unable to participate equal to other members? That those are things that need to be considered. Uh, and and so, according to the rules, you should approve. You you have to have something in the bylaws that first of all even allows you to have an electronic meeting, and secondly, you should vote on technology such as what you're using for voting. It has to be accepted by the body because in both of these cases, you're giving up rights from the, the gold standard of what a democratic meeting is uh, defined as. So this is the section that Kerry was referring to earlier. And this is what the charter says in very clean, clear, clear English. The national convention shall be the highest authority of the democratic party subject to the provisions of this charter. 
can't get any less clear, any more clear than that. I don't think so. <laughs> so, um, and here's a, what I, I alluded to: Charter uh, Article 10, Section 1. This charter may be amended by a vote of a majority of all the delegates to the national convention, provided that no such amendment shall be effective unless and until it is subsequently ratified by a void vote of the majority of the entire membership of the Democratic National Committee. The charter may also be amended by a vote of two-thirds of the entire membership of the Democratic National Committee. So this is a, a lower threshold than at a regular DNC meeting, um, you know, because the, the DNC meets, what, like quarterly? And um, so that would require a two-thirds vote, and whereas it can be done by a, a majority vote at the National Convention. And then it gets, you know, ratified, blah, blah, blah. But um, that's still, I mean, that's extraordinary that that's the thing. So that is why, of course, they want to abridge everybody's, you know, the delegates to the National Convention. They want to abridge your rights down to um, make it as difficult as possible for you to um, uh, actually enact any changes. In Allegedly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, and then in the bylaws, so remember we have the charter at the top and then below the charter is the bylaws. And these are both contained in uh, basically the same PDF. And uh, if you want to read these, uh, we have them posted on the pdpr.org website. So you can pull them up and see what they are. Uh, so bylaws- and They are also at the DNC. They're posted on the DNC website as well. Yes. Uh, the bylaws may be adopted or amended by a majority vote of the National Convention, so again, the convention that's happening uh, in August, or the Democratic National Committee provided the 30 days written notice of any proposed bylaw or amendment has been given to all members of the National Committee, and then unless adopted in the form of an amendment to the charter or otherwise designated, any resolution adopted by the National Convention relating to the governance of the party shall be considered a bylaw. So that just says that, that things are not in the charter So, uh, Chair Perez, uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, released a statement, and he said, in order to streamline convention proceedings and provide maximum flexibility in light of the pandemic, the resolution also makes changes to the process of how the reports of the rules and credential standing committees will be considered. The RBC reaffirmed during the discussions that these changes are only in effect for the 2020 convention and do not impact for a future convention. So that language right there, that that reaffirmation is a little bit problematic because you can't just say something is so when it's not included in the actual resolution. So if you make a resolution and that is in effect a change to the bylaws, then that's it, it's, it's there and it just stands there forever. So then if somebody just comes, you know, a random person or a random committee says, oh, no, this is just for this one convention. Don't worry about it. I would be really suspicious of that. So that's just me. <laughs> and in this case, the changes that we're discussing were changes to the call of the convention. So the DNC mm -hmm. modified the call of the convention as opposed to the bylaws. So that's why he can say, oh, this is just for 2020 because it was just to the call of the 2020 convention. However... Right. I think we need to watch this very closely. Yeah. So this is what your, your Democratic National Committee members passed earlier this year. So every state has members to the Democratic National Committee um, and uh, they also were unable to meet physically together and debate this stuff. So this was sent out as a, uh, an electronic uh, item, which we're gonna talk about, but this is, this is what they passed. So under the call, the, the Democratic National Convention Committee has the authority to plan, arrange, manage, and conduct the convention, including the authority to set and alter the date, the timing, the format, the voting mechanisms, the structure, and other logistical aspects of the convention outlined in the call. This authority includes, for example, changing the date from July 13th to August 17th, and all other actions that must be taken in order to ensure the safety of convention participants and the general public and compliance with any applicable laws, including but not limited to those concerning public health and ballot access. 
So this was a resolution that was passed by your representatives that took all of the power of the convention and handed it over to the planning committee. And I don't know about you, but I have no idea who is on the Democratic National Convention Committee. So that's interesting. So uh, the rule that was used to pass this resolution um, is um, the bylaws were amended based on the following language. The chairperson of the National Committee may refer matters to the members of the National Committee for consideration and vote by mail. Provided, however, that if members aggregating more than 20% of the full membership shall so request, the matter shall be presented at the next meeting of the National Committee. So since we can't have in-person meetings because of the pandemic, uh, the chairman said, hey, we're just going to send this out by uh, email and you guys can vote on it. And apparently nobody had any problem with that. So um, they could they do that. So um, classifying bylaws changes as, quote, matters to be voted on without debate is um, at best not good practice, but technically would be allowed. Um, uh, I think, uh, and, and this will be kind of our <laughs> recurring theme here, <laughs> is that technically this stuff was, you know, parliamentary speaking, pretty, uh, all right, uh, you know, and, and kosher, and, you know, democratically, small d democratically speaking, this is uh, at best not the not the best practice. <laughs> and even though we're, we're saying that the bylaws were amended, what they really amended was the call of the convention, but they amended the call of the right. convention that took away rights that have been given to the convention members in the charter and the bylaws. So uh, it, in my opinion, this was actually a, an ill, uh, an invalid motion to be made in the first place. Right. So sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> Uh, so uh, they also. This is also what they passed. It's, they said the rules committee shall adopt the permanent rules of the con convention and the convention agenda. So this is this is what we talked about in the last section. This is what you normally do at the beginning of the convention by the delegations. Uh, select the permanent officers of the convention. So the rules committees is selecting those as well. Propose amendments, if any, to the charter of the Democratic Party of the United States for the convention's consideration. This is what we will be proposing tomorrow in the People for Democratic Party reform are, are some resolutions that we will be submitting to the Rules Committee for consideration. And, you know, if, if there was a God, they would show up on the convention floor for uh, passage and propose resolutions concerning any other matter not provided for in the permanent rules of the convention and not contained in the reports of other standing committees for the convention's consideration. So here's where all the power from the delegation from the convention delegation to do this was handed over to the rules committee. And this is what your DNC members approved. And then it also says no amendment to the charter of the Democratic Party shall be effective unless it is subsequently ratified by a vote of the majority of the entire membership of the Democratic National Committee. The adopted report of the rules committee may be amended upon the adoption by a majority of the convention delegates presented in voting of any minority report passed pursuant to Article 7.I.3. So basically, the uh, so the original call to the National Convention um, said that the Rules Committee will present for consideration the permanent rules of the convention and um, something about uh, the, the officers of the convention. Um, but now the, it's for the you know, convention delegates to vote on, and they just kind of bypass that. And so those who have the, the rules and bylaws committee uh, just propose these meetings and pass them themselves. Um, no delegates required. So, you know, democracy is just a whole lot of very inconvenient. So uh, it's much easier if we just uh, let the rules and bylaws committee just take care of all that for us. Um, this is some other stuff that they passed. So, uh... This art other article was deleted and replaced with the following language. The Credentials Committee shall determine and resolve questions concerning the seating of delegates and alternates to the convention pursuant to the resolution entitled Relationship Between the 2020 Rules of Procedure of the Credentials Committee and the 2020 Delegate Selection Rules, which includes the Rules of Procedure of the Credentials Committee of the 2020 Democratic National Convention, hereby approved and adopted by the Democratic National Committee and set forth in full in the appendix of this call. So. 
this is handing over the approval of the credentials to the credentials committee, not to the um, not to the delegates of the convention. Uh, and in the next segment is where we're going to talk about how this has been uh, an important step in the process in the past and has been controversial. So all this has been swept aside uh, and done before the convention convenes as well. Right. So uh, again, you know, don't want to have any of that inconvenient democracy uh, where delegates actually get to vote on things uh, because, you know, COVID and all that. So um, just uh, the original language, again, was basically that the credentials committee will present this information and then it'll get approved by the delegation. Um, and we're just, we're skipping that um, in effect. So um, it's... It's a little bit frustrating to uh, see this. So um, kind of jumping ahead here to how that resolution was passed. So uh, that language was presented to the DNC by mail um, to the DNC members to vote on. So there was no debate. There was no amendment. There was no nothing. So um, there's rights, you know, two and three taken away. Um, and um, and so it was well, just one, basically two. just sent. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was, um, you know, just given to you um, if you were a DNC delegate, and you were just left to your own devices to to read it, to understand it, to see what it does. And then there was no mechanism for changing it or or doing anything about it. Um, and again, that's um, a slightly problematic, um, but. Uh, that's 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 what happened. So and, and it was written as a resolution, and there's a page of of uh, whereases wrapping this in COVID nineteen, uh, blah okay. blah blah. Which you know, when you think about it, it doesn't doesn't mean that all of your rights has to be taken away from the convention just because it's going to be an electronic convention. So they've used right. the excuse of the pandemic to take away your rights. So just to recap how your rights were removed, and this is looking at the biggest, bigger picture, the DNC chair was elected in 2017 by a margin of 35 votes or the vote of 18 delegates. So if 18 delegates had voted the other way, we would not have had the current chair. The DNC chair, DNC chair has the, has the right to appoint members to the rules and bylaws committee, and that, that's what they did. There are no restrictions on or qualifications for who sits on that committee. They are completely appointed by the DNC chair. The DNC, the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee drafted a resolution that violates the charter and removed power from the convention delegates and gave that power to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And then your elected DNC delegates approved this resolution. And they were, it was pretty much a gun to the head because of the language used to, to say that these changes were absolutely necessary because of the pandemic. And they apparently, a majority of them had bought that argument. So if you find this problematic, I would encourage you to, number one, identify who your DNC members are and have a conversation with them about what their right, what their responsibilities are to the membership uh, and have a discussion with them about why no one stood up and objected to this. Because if anyone did, uh, I would like to hear the story of it and give them a Medal of Freedom Award because um, <laughs> I suspect that their actions were unique. Well, and if I remember right, the, the vote approving these changes was like virtually was overwhelming. So uh, that's 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 neat that we don't want to have actual democracy in the Democratic Party. Um, so here's how they did it technically. So the since they were amending the call of the convention, which uh, the, the you know, the, the rules and bylaws committee um, writes the call. So they basically, they in, they own that document and so they can amend it. So the Democratic National Committee, the DNC members, voted basically to instruct the RBC to change the language of the call of the convention. And technically that would be allowed. It's their document, they can change it. Um, but you can't have the call conflicting with the charter um, because the charter is the governing document. There's a hierarchy of documents. Um, so while the RBC has the right 
to alter their documents, they still can't approve changes that violate their governing broad documents. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. Um, so parliamentary speaking, they do have the right to change it, but what they changed it to was where the conflict comes in. And the way they did it, again, while it might be technically uh, permitted in parliament, you know, parliamentary speaking, democ democratically speaking, it was pretty crappy, um, in my opinion. <laughs> and this is where the outdated nature of Robert's Rules of Order sort of impedes our ability to call a point of order and say, point of order, uh, that resolution conflicts with the, uh, with the charter uh, because there's been no meeting held where anyone could do that. And that, you know, the, the original assumption is that whenever you have a meeting, you would make decisions together and you would have the ability to do this. And we've, we had the same thing done to us in our own state where the delegate selection plan was done outside of the state central committee. And uh, we've reviewed the tapes where they claim that we were told about it. And, and it was done in such obscure language that, uh, no one heard it. Um, the fundamental processes of a democracy is that these things are done with meeting, in meetings and that a majority gets to approve it after debate and that it was totally bypassed. Right. And there's no uh, ability to challenge it. That's the main point I was trying to make. Well, and, um, you know, these are always uh, or often you know, couched in, you know, we have to do these things because of whatever, you know, the, um, or, you know, there's just no more time to, you know, debate or amend these things. Um, that's what happened in our state with the delegate selection plan was it was present, it was approved two days before the deadline. And so there was like, no, we don't have time to, to make any changes. And they had scheduled a meeting of the state central committee you know, a week after the deadline had passed. So it's like, oh, you know, what can you do? There's, there, you know, there's just nothing we could do with the deadline was done and the meeting wasn't scheduled until after the deadline conveniently. So um, that's the kind of um, things, uh, the kind of weaponization of parliamentary procedure that, um, that really rubs me the wrong way. Um, so to recap how your rights were removed, the resolution is invalid because resolutions can't conflict with the charter. Um, the, uh, um, and so the article, uh, article two, section three states that the national convention shall adopt a platform. Um, and then it also states the convention delegates, um, act upon such matters as is deemed appropriate. Um, but in this case, delegates are told that their participation would end on August 15th, two days before the convention, um, which now I would say is just a, a television program will actually occur. So how do we prevent this from occurring in the future? Uh, you know, no one's going to call the convention invalid and, and be successful because it, because of these changes that were made to this this year's convention. What we need to do is get uh, leadership inside the party that respects the rights of the membership. So number one, we need to elect a DNC chair that respects the rights of Democrats in 2021. So in the, the beginning of next year, there will be a election for a DNC chair, either the current one will run for a election or someone else will uh, challenge them and, and we will have a choice. Between then, between now and then, we need to elect DNC members and state chairs who believe that the Democratic Party is actually a grassroots organization uh, as described in the section one of the charter itself. And, and DNC members have already been elected in some states, uh, but this is a process that will go on for the next couple of months. And so, you know, you need to ask your candidates who are running as DNC members, if they believe that in the in democracy, and make them swear that they do before you give them your vote, uh, we need to make our DNC delegates accountable uh, to the state delegates, not the DNC leadership. So when we elect delegates in our state to the Democratic National Committee, they are supposed to be representing us. They are not representing the leadership of the party. It's it's supposed to be a 
a bottoms up organization, not a top down. And then what we will be considering tomorrow is a series of resolutions to amend the charter and the bylaws that will, that will uh, restore democracy to this, the, the fundamental way the party uh, uh, performs so that they are accountable to the Democrats. Uh, and a, an example of that is the appointment of the members of the Rules and Bylaws Committee, which currently is, is uh, there is no restraints on or guidelines for what the chair can do. And so what we will be proposing is that the members of these committee are elected from the state parties. Uh, and that will also in, uh, ensure some sort of some level of geographic uh, uh, distribution across the United States, because uh, if you look at the membership of the current Rules and Bylaws Committee, it's very East Coast centric, and uh, it's hard to believe that many of them actually understand democracy and how rules should be written to protect democracy. They seem to be more politically motivated, uh, and that's not how it should be in my humble opinion. So uh, anything you'd like to add before we add, ask, go, ask for questions, Carrie? Um, just that, you know, uh, I know DNC delegates have been elected in some states already, um, but for the, the states that are remaining, um, like it's, it's really important to get, um, to get some good people in there. Um, and, and in numbers, I mean, it's, it's, I know we have in the past and probably for this next round have elected some great people, but if they are just, you know, lonely voices in the wilderness, and that's not really very effective, not to mention it's really hard emotionally on the folks that are there and struggling in the trenches and they don't have any kind of support. Um, so, uh, you know, it's frustrating that it, it that the problem with a, with a grassroots movement is, you know, the stuff at the very top is always the last to change because we're starting from the roots. So, you know, you change your county parties, you change your, uh, or however your state is structured, you know, and work your way up to the state social committee and then up to the DNC. And so those DNC positions, those are going to be, you know, the hardest to, to change in great number. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's worth the struggle and we'll just keep on, uh, keep on working at it and uh, but the more people you get involved um, the easier it is for those people who are already there um, I know I personally just you know as a personal anecdote like when new people come in and get involved and they're all excited and, and gung-ho like there is a small part of me that's a little bit resentful it's like where were you two years ago or where were you four years ago and I know that's not fair but you know, just emotionally speaking, like, you know, support folks that are in there and fighting and, you know, doing that work to, to lay groundwork for, you know, the next level of change. So, questions? <laughs> I, I have to soapbox a little bit more before we go. So, uh, you remember that all of these, off, there, there, there are provisions for recalling officers. So, if you find that you have elected DNC members who are not reflecting the will of the people and certainly in your state, you can recall them. There is a process for recalling them. Uh, and it's also acknowledged in the, the bylaws of the DNC. So you can get them. And even if you're not successful, at least it puts them on notice. Uh, I'm, I'm a former DNC member and I know firsthand that there are a lot of DNC members who just run for these positions and they're automatically re reelected and they go to the DNC meetings quarterly and they are just social uh, gatherings. They, there's a, a series of meetings you go to, no business is enacted and no one behaves as a representative. They are just uh, basically attending a couple of meetings and catching up with uh, their friends. But you need to elect DNC members who will go and then uh, propose these resolutions. And then when they come up for a vote on the floor of the DNC, uh, support them with their vote. And it is only by getting a majority or when required a two-thirds vote that we will get these fundamental changes enacted.